I'm Marion O'Leary. I'm a scientist, educator, and musician. I've spent 40 years teaching and doing research in chemistry and biochemistry and exercising my musical skills at the same time. The juxtaposition of arts and science is one of the real themes for today. This magnificent painting, recently finished by one of our guests today, Michael Killen, will be one of the focal points of our discussion. Later on, you will have a chance to hear Michael talk about the painting and how it fits into the issues of climate change. Climate change, so familiar and so unfamiliar. We hear about it in our news media. We hear stories about how climate change is already affecting our lives and how these effects are likely to become more in the future. But people are often uncomfortable and have unresolved questions about climate change. They worry about what California will be like in another several decades. Our discussion today won't answer all of those questions, but we hope to at least pick up a broad spectrum of those topics. We will start with a discussion by Chris Field of what has been learned recently about the science of climate change. This will be followed by a discussion of climate change and politics by environmentalist Elton Sherwin. Then we will continue with a talk by our local television producer and artist, Michael Killen, about the role of art and culture, and in particular, his wonderful painting. We'll close with an opportunity for all of you to participate in the discussion by asking our speakers questions that you have about climate change. Let's move now to our first speaker. Chris Field is director of the Department of Global Ecology at the Carnegie Institution for Science, which was one of the first ecology departments to focus on the concept of global worldwide ecology rather than the more localized form that it used to take. He's also a professor at Stanford, and for the last five years, he has been co-chair of Working Group 2 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Their report, Impacts, Adaptations, and Vulnerability, was issued just this past March, and I'm sure that one of the things that he will talk about for us today is the results of that report. Chris is a very well-known, highly published scientist. His publications have been cited more than 49,000 times. And he has been a leader in the concept of what we call the Earth system, the idea that the whole Earth is one large connected ecosystem, and nothing that happens in one place is independent of what happens in the rest of the world. Chris, welcome. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. I want to do three things. I'd like to talk a little bit about where we are in understanding the climate changes that have already occurred, what we know about projections, and what we know about solutions. But before doing that, I want to talk for just a couple of minutes about the assessment of climate change and how we think we know what we know. Um, you've probably heard that there are lots of questions now about reliability of science, especially with biomedical studies. And how is it that you decide one study's right and another study's wrong? In, in climate, we're incredibly fortunate because we've been very systematic about assembling the overall perspectives of the scientific community. Within the last year, there have been highly organized, systematic reviews of what we know and what we don't know from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, it's the biggest science society in the US, of the Royal Society, the main scientific organization of science excellence in the UK and the National Academy of Sciences in the US, the, the, the leading scientific body in the US, all finding essentially the same thing. And in addition to that, we've seen major assessments from something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, something that I've been privileged to work with for the last dozen years. And I want to say just a couple of things about the way the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, works. Uh, the IPCC is governmental, intergovernmental, and essentially, 25 years ago, the world's governments came to the scientific community and they said, hey, you scientific community, if you'll follow our rules about doing systematic assessments, we'll consider them the definitive statement of what we know and what we don't know about climate science. And the rules are complicated. They involve uh, efforts to do absolutely comprehensive reviews, to identify author teams from around the world, 
uh, to go through multiple rounds of independently monitored for reviews for the, uh, for the uh, report that we just completed. We had over 50,000 review comments from around the world. Every one of those review comments had to be individually responded to uh, with a separate group of scientists evaluating whether the responses were appropriate. And the process proceeds such that by the time the assessment's done, uh, it's really a product of the entire scientific community. It's not me writing as a scientist or Marion writing as a scientist. It's the scientific community statement. And then we get to the final approval. The document is approved word by word, by consensus, by all the world's governments. Think about what that means. Uh, we're in the plenary approval session for the Working Group 2 report. And I put the first sentence up on the whiteboard and says, um, changes in the climate system are unequivocal. I say, does anyone agree, or does everyone agree, does anyone not agree, that that sentence represents an accurate statement of where we are with the science? Uh, your Kuwait, your uh, Tuvalu, and, and uh, your India, and uh, when I first put the statement up, uh, probably 50 countries would say they're not convinced. And we don't move on until every country is convinced that that is the definitive statement of what we know and what we don't know. It's an amazing process. When you think about it, you could easily imagine that we would never get beyond a one-line summary. But in fact, we do because the science really is so robustly assembled that it's essentially bulletproof. And so what I want to talk with you about today is the scientific findings of the entire scientific community. Sometimes we talk about it as consensus, but it, it's not that the science is a consensus, it's a consensus that this is what we understand and this is what we don't understand. So that's the, the starting point for the material I want to present. And the starting point is really quite profound. There's essentially no doubt that the climate has changed, changed dramatically in the last hundred years or so. We've seen a warming that worldwide has been about one and a half Fahrenheit degrees. Essentially no question that humans have caused the majority of the changes we've seen over the last 50 years or so. Climate change is not some hypothetical possibility for the future. It's something that's real. It's happening now. And it's also impacting physical systems, biological systems, and people around the world. Uh, that's a second major conclusion that I want to talk about, which is that uh, when we talk about impacts, it's not hypothetical impacts about faraway places and, and unknown species. We've really seen impacts of climate changes that have already occurred. They've been widespread, consequential. We've seen impacts on every continent. We've seen impacts from the equator to the poles and from the mountains to the coast. We've seen impacts on physical systems, the length of glaciers, the timing of rivers. We've seen impacts on biological systems, uh, the ranges of species, the timing of biological events, the extent of forest fires. And we've seen impacts on human systems, uh, the amounts of agricultural productivity, We've seen impacts on livelihoods, things like uh, commercial activities with fishing, uh, even transportation. There's essentially no question that the climate changes that have already occurred have had major substantial impacts. There's also no question that vulnerability to climate change is widespread. You know, we, we tend to think about vulnerability as most concentrated among the world's poor. Uh, people who have limited access to control over their own lives, uh, where inequality creates challenges, uh, where lack of resources means there's a lack of, uh, of options for dealing with climate. But, but when you really look about it, what we see is that some of the most difficult challenges are for those people, but some of the uh, least preparation we see in the world's rich societies. And that was really brought home in a, in a really crystallizing way with Hurricane Sandy in New York in late 2011. And there we had over $60 billion of damages from a, from a serious but not unheard of level of storm. And it showed a striking level of lack of preparation. Uh, essentially, we're all setting ducks. And there's no place in the world that's really prepared to deal for the impacts of, of the climate variations that we're already seeing, uh, independent of whether those are associated with climate change. There's also no question that we're starting to think about climate solutions. Investments in adaptation, in coping as effectively as possible with the 
climate changes that can't be avoided are already beginning to occur. We're seeing some kinds of climate adaptations that are heavy duty engineering solutions, things like flood barriers, where there's a big one in, in London, there's a barrier under construction in, in Venice, uh, there's a barrier operating in Rotterdam, big heavy duty engineering solutions. But we're also seeing lots of community based solutions, uh, planting mangroves for coastal protection throughout the tropics, uh, societies that are organizing. We've even seen some societies, uh, First Nation societies in Alaska, that have asked to move as a consequence of coastal erosion that's been accelerated by climate change. Adaptation really is beginning to occur. Uh, the other thing we can do about climate change is mitigation to actually decrease emissions of heat trapping gases and to decrease the amount of climate change that occurs. And we're already beginning to see some progress with mitigation. Even though fossil emissions are continuing to, to increase, we now live in a world where something like two-thirds of total greenhouse gas emissions are covered by some kind of an agreement. We can talk about whether they're effective agreements, but there's some kind of an agreement that covers two-thirds of the current emissions. What it means is that we're beginning to learn, we're beginning to have experience, see what works, what doesn't, what we need to change in order to be more effective. Um, let me stop for a minute and talk about managing climate risks moving forward before I talk about what those are. It, it's really clear that the best way to think about climate change impacts is to think about them in the context of risk. And there are at least five reasons it's useful to think about climate change impacts in the, in the context of risk. Uh, the first is that in a changing climate, we're going to see many of the kinds of things we see now. Heat waves, severe storms, uh, uh, coastal floods, hurricanes. But we're going to see the, a different frequency and a different pattern of them. Uh, when you think about risk, you can think about connecting the responses to current variability with the things we'll see in the future. And, and well, a, a second reason is that most of the impacts from a changing climate are going to occur in extremes. It's going to be the hottest days, the highest tides, the strongest winds. It, whether or not climate change actually changes the strength of those things, where things break in a changing climate is where you're in extremes. And we should recognize that when we want to understand the risk, we need to understand the risk from the extremes. A, th a third reason we want to be really clear about understanding climate change challenge and managing risks is that we want to be focused on the full range of possible outcomes. The scientific community has invested vast resources in understanding the most likely outcomes of climate change. And I'm sure you've heard temperature projections, which give a, a central projection. Um, but in general, we care very little about the central projections in an environment with risk. Uh, when you get in your car and you're uh, happy that you have car insurance, seat belts, and anti-lock brakes, it's not because you expect to have an accident. It's because there is a full range of possibilities. And that full range of possibilities includes one where the seat belts, the airbags, the anti-lock brakes could potentially make a difference. So with climate, we want to recognize that even though we have a pretty good understanding of the most likely outcomes, uh, where things really are likely to matter is at the extremes. And we want to make sure that we are sensitive to understanding the consequences of being at the extremes. A, a fourth reason it's really important to think about climate change as a challenge in managing risk is sort of a good news story. And it's that we already have a wide range of sophisticated tools that we use every day uh, for managing risk. These are tools that are available from the scale of the family to the firm to the government. At the, at the family, it's investments in um, home insurance, safe vehicles, things like early warning. At the level of the firm, it's hedging your investment portfolio, thinking about uh, depreciation schedules of infrastructure. And at the level of government, it's things like investments in national security, uh, thinking about the time scale of infrastructure. Lots and lots of sophisticated thinking at all levels in society it already goes into managing risk. That's exactly the thinking we need to be successful in dealing with climate change. And then a final reason that I think it's really critical to recognize that climate change challenge in managing risk is that climate change in general doesn't introduce dramatically new kinds of problems. What climate change tends to do is add new dimensions, new complexities, and new probabilities to problems that we already face problems with severe storms, high temperatures, 
um, uh, sea level associated events. And so what we need to recognize in that context is that climate change isn't kind of a new player on the horizon. It's more of a threat multiplier. And as a threat multiplier, we need to think harder about the kinds of solutions that we already apply in terms of protecting societies with early warning systems, with good investments in infrastructure for providing emergency services, and with um, thoughtful responses to disasters. So from that perspective, climate change uh, looks in some ways more challenging, but in many ways much more manageable. It's a continuum with things that we've already done. Uh, as I step away from this topic of understanding climate change as challenging managing risk, let me say one more thing. When you look at disasters, what you see is it's not typically the biggest trigger from the natural system that causes the biggest disasters. Uh, what typically happens is that disasters represent uh, an overlap between some kind of a trigger from the climate system, we call it a hazard, uh, vulnerability, a propensity to be harmed by the people and ecosystems, and, and exposure, having things, assets in harm's way. And it's only at the overlap of the hazard, the vulnerability, and the exposure that you end up with a risk of a disaster. And the same is true for climate change. You need a hazard, that's the, the change in climate. You need vulnerability, the lack of preparedness that we know we all have, and exposure. One of the interesting things about understanding risk of climate change as the overlap between hazard, vulnerability, and exposure is it means there are lots of things we can think about in terms of solutions. One kind of solution is decreasing the hazard, mitigation to decrease the amount of climate change that occurs, but others involve thinking hard about the way society works to decrease vulnerability and exposure, being better prepared and making sure that where we make investments, they're not in the wrong places. Let me talk now uh, in this, with this framing of understanding climate as a challenge and managing risk about where we think we're headed in the future. You know, essentially, you can imagine the future as having uh, two big swaths of possibilities. One swath of possibilities says we totally ignore the risk of climate change and we continue in a world with high emissions. Uh, we end the 21st century with a global average temperature that's something like four centigrade, about seven Fahrenheit, warmer than pre-industrial, uh, with a wide range of impacts. Uh, the other extreme, we could have a world of ambitious investments in mitigation, holding down the amount of climate change that occurs as ambitiously as possible. And realistically, with ambitious mitigation, we might end the 21st century at something like 2C, about 3.6 Fahrenheit over pre-industrial temperatures. That's about twice as much warming as we've already seen. A substantial amount, and we'd see substantial impacts from that. Um, before I talk about the specific projections for impacts in those two worlds, let me say something about the time periods. It, it's gonna take us a long time to be effective with mitigation. Even with ambitious mitigation, we're gonna see impacts of climate changes that are already baked into the system for the next several decades. Essentially, no matter how ambitious we are with mitigation, most of the impacts over the next few decades are already baked into the system. They're baked in as a consequence of the physics of the way the climate system works, and they're baked in as a consequence of the uh, inertia in social, economic, industrial processes. Uh, what that means is that over the next few decades, the primary tool we have for dealing with climate change is adaptation. We need to be better prepared for the climate changes that will come. That doesn't mean that we don't need to worry about mitigation during that period. In fact, one of the great conceptual challenges in climate change is for us to be effective at ambitious mitigation to hold total warming to this 3.6 by the end of the century. We really need to be making the investments in the near term rather than in the long term. So what, what are the worlds uh, with uh, ambitious mitigation or um, uh, continued high emissions look like. In a world with ambitious mitigation, where we might end the century at something like 3.6 degrees above pre-industrial, we'll still see a wide range of impacts. The ocean will be substantially more acidic. There'll be continued threats to, um, to a wide range of ecosystem processes. Ag yields will be impacted around the world, such that it's more and more difficult to increase ag yields. And there'll be differences in the kinds of activities that could be pursued
in lots of different places. Uh, particularly changes in activity that are conditioned by changes in extreme events. You know, uh, farmers rarely decide to give up on growing crops because uh, every year is below some threshold. The kinds of factors that determine whether activities that occur are, are how, frequency, how frequently do conditions become unacceptable. So the thing to remember about a world with ambitious mitigation, however, is that the total amount of warming by the end of the century is only about as much warming from now as we've already seen over the last century. In general, that's an amount that's going to be serious, and it's going to take careful investments in adaptation, but it's a level of climate change that, to, in most places, can be effectively managed. On the other hand, the world of continued high emissions, a world that's ending the century at something like 7 to 8 Fahrenheit above pre-industrial, is one where it's very difficult for us to make reasonable projections. Uh, the way I think about it is that when I'm asked to describe the world of 2100 with continued high emissions, I pretty much say, well, all bets are off. We have a few ideas of areas where uh, traditional kinds of agriculture may not be possible. Uh, we have a clear picture of uh, massive redistributions of rainfall such that the high latitudes and the tropics get much wetter. Uh, a few parts of the subtropics, Southern California, the Mediterranean, Australia, get much drier. But it's really hard to predict where things break because we're looking at a world that's so much different than the world from now. And it's hard to say whether the primary consequences are going to be serious consequences for human health, which get compounded with issues with food production and uh, delivery of emergency services or within their area of economic activity where in many parts of the world it would be too hot for people to work outside during large chunks of the year, or whether they're in uh, ecosystems where in, uh, there's a risk that a very large fraction of the world's total diversity will be committed to extinction. Uh, the, the way we think about it in the IPCC is there, there are at least five different baskets of issues we care about in the future and the risk to each of those baskets is dramatically different in a world with ambitious mitigation than a world with continued high emissions. And they give you a, a feel for the kinds of assets are at risk and also for why it's so difficult to come up with a simple traditional cost-benefit analysis about whether this is a problem that is uh, worth a given level of investment. Uh, the first of these risks is risk to rare and endangered systems. We already know that a few species have gone extinct as a result of climate change. We also know that there are lots of uh, threatened species around the world. Uh, there are also unique archaeological and historical sites that are at risk. We've already seen some impacts, and, and the risk of even ambitious mitigation is, is far from trivial. Uh, a second important category is the risk of extreme events. I've already described the ways that it's super difficult to figure out what how to process extreme events in, um, in economic terms. Uh, a third category that's important is sort of the unfairness aspect of climate change. Many of the impacts of climate change fall most harshly on people who contributed least to the problem, and it's really difficult to figure out how to price the greater impacts on those folks than on the, than the societies that contributed the most. A fourth category is large-scale singular events. We have good evidence that somewhere between about 3 and 6 degrees Fahrenheit, we're likely to see collapse of one of the world's major ice sheets. The sea level equivalent in total melting of the Greenland ice sheet is about 23 feet. And while melting of the Greenland ice sheet would occur over many centuries, uh, once we're committed, as far as we know, we're, we're committed. And uh, there's, there's no question that these large-scale events really could have a, a huge leverage. Uh, and the fifth is the global aggregate impacts, impacts on total availability of fresh water, total availability of food, total economic activity. And in some ways, those are, the, those are the simple ones. Those are the ones we can price. But until we can understand impacts across that whole space, it's really difficult to come up with, uh, with uh, a, a simple metric that says how much we should invest. Now, I want to close with some thoughts on solutions that take a different approach to this cost-benefit approach. And it's instead of cost-benefit approach, it's a co-benefits approach. 
And we know now when we look at the impacts of climate change, when we look at the things that we're trying to accomplish with adaptation and mitigation, that we're not really talking about trade-offs where we have to pull resources away from sustainable development in order to adapt or pull resources away from sustainable development in order to mitigate. If we do this right, what we're talking about is investments in adaptation, mitigation, and sustainable development that work together. They work together in a way that helps build communities that are robust, economies that are growing, and societies that are vibrant. How can we do that? We can do it by being thoughtful about a, an approach that says, uh, how can adaptation contribute to things we need now as well as things we need in the future? How can adaptation help us deal as effectively as possible with the world we live in? At the same time, it, it builds a sustainable future. And with mitigation, we can say, what are the investments that create a fair playing field that create opportunities for innovation, and that more than anything else, use investments in the future in order to build vibrant societies and, and robust economies. And at least for me, the estimates of the cost of climate change pale in comparison to these co-benefits that come from thinking carefully, planning ahead, and being serious about building solutions. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Many things to think about. There will be an opportunity to ask Chris questions at the end of the session when we have a question and answer session. But I would like to move on now and introduce Elton Sherwin. Elton Sherwin, a longtime friend of mine, is what we sometimes recur refer to as a recovering venture capitalist. He has had a number of interesting careers. He is currently senior vice president at Proxio, which is a global real estate referral network for real estate professionals. But he is also the author of a book, which I think he will tell you a little bit about. And if you've not read it, I do recommend it to you. It's called Addicted to Energy, and it fits into our story very closely. But right now, Elton, it is your turn to talk about science, climate change, and politics. Thank you, Mary. So if you're watching this show, you are likely concerned about climate change. And if you're concerned about climate change, you have been studied by social science researchers and demographers, and we know actually quite a bit about you, statistically speaking. You are more likely to own a Prius or a hybrid vehicle or an electric car than the population in general. You're more concerned about the environment. You're more likely to recycle. You are more likely to put your trust in a scientist than in a televangelist. And it is less likely that you will describe as your primary source of news Fox TV. <laughs> Some of you would describe yourselves as thoughtful, progressive, an environmentalist, or green. And some well-meaning environmentalists, and I think one might say many environmentalists, believe that if everyone were just educated the way they were educated and bought more efficient cars, went to the farmer's market and bought locally grown organic food, recycled diligently and put in the correct light bulb, that we would have this climate problem licked. Those environmentalists, many of whom are my friends, are in complete denial. Organic food, recycling, and better cars are not going to solve the climate problem. To solve the climate, pro to, to solve the climate problem, we have got to eliminate the emissions from a billion cars. We've got to eliminate the emissions from or replace all of the coal-fired power plants on the planet. And somehow, we don't know how, we need to either eliminate the emissions from or replace all of the world's dairy herds and cattle. 
And when we've solved the three C's, cars, coal, and cows, we will have solved about half the problem. We'll have done about half of what we need to do. So the scale is just enormous. So sell your car, take public transit, become a vegetarian, give up air travel, and then convince 7 billion people to do the same, and we will have solved half the problem. Maybe we get halfway there. So the challenge is so large, you can see why one rational response is party on. <laughs> Watch Fox News and hope that technology will save our grandchildren. Because we have many examples of technology coming to the rescue. So how should we, as concerned citizens who don't want to go down the road of party on and hope the technology can save our grandchildren. How should we begin to think about this problem? Well, here's how I think about it. So right now, we're at about 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. And we're on what I would describe as a fairly steep trajectory that I think it's hard to envision that we're going to plateau below 450. It's looking like we're going to go over 450. and. Uh, Chris has looked at, at, at many models, and we could debate how much over 450 we're going to go. Safe is something below 400. And I think the consensus of scientists is that it's probably closer to 350, maybe even under 350, than 400. So you reach some inescapable conclusions that unless you fudge the numbers, there's some things that have to happen. One is you've got to be able to create an industrial society that can deliver heating and cooling and transportation and air travel and meat and pull several billion people out of poverty into the middle class. And you need to be able to reinvent an industrial society and do that at net zero or close to net zero. And when you've done that, you then need to pull an awful lot of CO2 out of the air and lock it up in something, in cement, in the soil, underground, under the ocean, or somewhere. And if you can't do all that fast enough and you want to protect the polar ice sheets, then in addition to pulling the CO2 out of the air, you may have to for a while reflect some of the sunlight back up into out of spa uh, outer space. So we need to create industrial economies that deliver the lifestyle that we have without or virtually without any of the carbon. And on top of that, we're going to be sitting somewhere north of 450 at that point. We're going to have to pull a lot of CO2 out of the air. And depending upon which model you believe and how quickly we do that and which ecosystem collapses first and which ice sheet goes, we may need a airbag uh, and a safety net to reflect some of the sunlight to keep uh, one of the great ice sheets from collapsing. So this is a huge, huge challenge um, uh, for us. A piece of the problem, of course, is conservation and all of the good green things that here in Palo Alto we know and love. Um, I, wrote, I wrote a book on this, and it makes 50 policy recommendations. And conservation is a significant piece of the solution. It may be necessary. It is absolutely not sufficient to get us where we need to go. So what should we do beyond simply being more efficient, replacing our light bulbs. You will not like the answer. So let me make five recommendations. I've picked what I think are the five hardest. Some would argue I've omitted the, uh, the sixth, which is to somehow take uh, uh, corporate money and PAC money out of politics. But putting that aside, um, let me uh, hit then the next five most difficult. And the reason that you won't like them, um, and I can guarantee that you will dislike at least one, if not all five of them, is because three of them are an absolute um, uh, uh, anathema to environmentalists. Uh, one is hated by the Fox News crew, and the fifth one is one that both the left and the right have collectively decided is a taboo topic. Um, and that it should not be talked about. So these policies are controversial, but I, I posit this to you before I take you through them. And that is that 
Each one that you strike off mentally is a tool that you take away from your grandchildren, an option that you deny them, and an increase in risk that you put upon our grandchildren. Um, so the first three that the green community doesn't like. Number one, we need to dramatically increase the amount of R&D that we put into figuring out how to pull CO2 out of the air and lock it into something. California's had two big projects um, that are probably not going to see the light of day, not killed by Fox News, but killed by the environmental community. And we're seeing this all around the world, um, that uh, anything that has to do with carbon sequestration, with coal-fired power plants, with putting carbon virtually anywhere, is having huge problems with the environmental movement. Um, we need that in our toolkit. Our grandchildren need that in their cool toolkit. Number two, we need to dramatically bump up, and I do mean really dramatically bump up, our R&D funding for the next two generations of nuclear power plants, sometimes referred to as walk away safe, molten salt, uh, uh, thorium, power plants, and the like. It takes at least 20 years to design and test a new generation of nuclear power plants. And if we don't get a start on it, we are essentially taking that option off the table for our grandchildren. As one Harvard scientist said, it's important to remember that CO2 has a half-life that is longer than uranium. And I can say with absolute certainty that CO2 is a much bigger risk to our civilization than thorium ever will be. Number three, another item that I think none of my environmentalist friends um, are enthusiastic about, and we need to be spending more money testing uh, and modeling various different geoengineering schemes so that we have the capacity to save an ice sheet when it collapses um, so that we know what to do and how much sunlight to reflect back and what is the least disruptive way to do it because we, um, particularly if we end up going down the seven degree scenario that Chris talked about, um, we may absolutely this century or next be able to do that. So um, item number four, uh, the item that surprisingly most conservatives hate, even though it is primarily a market mechanism, and that is we need a universally gradually increasing carbon tax on all carbon pollution worldwide on every source. Uh, we need to price the externalities um, that carbon creates into the product so that the magic hand and the market can adapt correctly to the true price of the products that we all consume. And finally, number five, and I, I ignored this for a long time. Uh, the climate community in general um, thinks this is, is not an, an issue. And as uh, I, we got involved in reforestation around the world, it became just very clear to me that um, uh, my nonprofit got involved in reforestation projects, that this is, this is a big issue. So the, the logic that goes on in, in most um, scientific communities is that it's the rich countries that generate most of the uh, uh, carbon footprint, and an extra two billion people are going to be dirt poor, and so they're irrelevant to the carbon equation. And that may be a half truth, but item five, the world's donors and aid organizations need absolutely to be committed to spending at least 10% of their health and public health spending on family planning. We should have no woman on a planet with seven to nine billion people who is having a child she doesn't want because she doesn't have access to birth control. So in summary, five things we can do, three of which the left doesn't like, nuclear power, geoengineering, and carbon capture, one of which the right doesn't like, uh, and that's a, a carbon tax or pollution tax, and one of which, interestingly enough, for the last 30 years, for some reason, has just really become a taboo topic on both the left and the right, and that is we need to have universal access to, to birth control for uh, the world's poor. I mentioned these five, partially because they will make for more interesting TV, um, but um, also because they've proven the hardest to do. We're getting actually pretty good at changing light bulbs, um, and we're getting a little bit better at building buildings. Um, Electric cars seem to be muddling along somewhat faster. Tesla's doing better than, than uh, many of us predicted and so forth. But these are the five, I think, that are going to be the most difficult uh, 
politically, emotionally, and spiritually to do, but I think they are key to protecting our grandchildren, and we should think long and hard about saying, well, we don't like this one, and this one's just not green enough for us, and we just take options away because they may need every option uh, later in this century. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elton. Lots of good food for thought. Many questions for all of us to think about today, days, months, years to come. Our third speaker today is Michael Killen, who comes at this from a rather different point of view. He is a longtime TV journalist, talk show host. He has been in the media for most of his life. He's the author of several books. He's been a leader in several businesses. But sometime a decade or perhaps more ago, he started getting into sustainability and climate change. That led him to an interest in art and to art which might somehow contribute to this very interesting and very rich debate about climate change. So today, he's going to talk specifically about his latest and, for me, most interesting creation, which we have here before us. Michael, it's good to have you with us. Thank you. A nice introduction. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Michael Killen. And uh, first, I'd like to say I think both of these gentlemen have just done a wonderful job. And one is. Uh, Chris has certainly given us a fine framework for thinking logically about what we're doing and the future. And Elton gave us a more down-to-earth as well as a lot of practical solutions. But Elton said something that caught my attention, troubled me a little bit, when he made this remark that sort of we should not watch the religious evangelists. And, and, and let me remind you, do you remember the day when Jimmy Swagger was caught with a prostitute and he had to go on television and say, I have sinned. Come on, that's good theater. <laughs> and this painting joins Don Quixote with the battle with climate change. I'm going to address two topics. One, I'm going to share what I heard in the world that motivated me to make this painting the way I made it, OK? And the other thing is I'm going to end with uh, two strategies, two out-of-the-box strategies that I think would be good for everyone to think about and possibly join and try to apl apply however you can. So the first part is the interpretation of this painting. One, I'm going to share what I heard in the world that motivated me to make this painting the way I made it. Okay? And the other thing is I'm going to end with uh, two strategies, two out-of-the-box strategies that I think would be good for everyone to think about and possibly join and try to apl apply however you can to ask the TV crew to prepare to run a small clip to remind you of who Don Quixote is. <laughs> Why Don Quixote, you may ask? We live in a world that emphasizes realistic expectations and clear successes. Quixote had neither. But through failure after failure, he persists in his visions and his commitments. He persists because he knows who he is. We explore how Quixote's kind of self-knowledge might serve modern leadership. En un lugar de la Mancha. In a village of La Mancha, no the name of which I have no desire to recall, no there lived, not so long ago, a gentleman. 
Quixote reminds us that if we trust only when trust is warranted, love only when love is returned, and learn only when learning is valuable, we abandon an essential element of our humanness. Four centuries after it was written, the Quixote vision still contains an important message for modern leadership. Many of those who study innovation would argue that willful imagination and persistence are essential for new ideas. Innovation demands a willingness to deviate from conventional knowledge and to persist in the face of failure. In short, to be foolish. A commitment to an identity provides a basis for that kind of useful craziness. For Quixote, however, that admirable consequence is irrelevant. And gentlemen, I'm ready to share some insights about what motivated me to make this painting. And first I'll share how it came about. I want to give someone credit for the idea of linking Don Quixote to climate change. I was having a dinner at Carol Harrington's house. I know a lot of you know that. Across from me was Jim Sweeney, the director of the Precourt Energy Center at Stanford University. And for, he said to me, Michael, two years ago, you were kind to put in, at, when we had our big energy summit, your 20-foot painting, 20-foot painting that I made for NASA. And it, and it was called sustainability. Okay? I tried to do fundamental things. I said, yes. And then I, and I said, yes. And then I made, I had this feeling when I was making sustainability that the world has changed and we're moving to the stage of resilience. I said, yeah, sure. We know what Chris has sort of said. Climate change is out of the box. Whew. And you know, we really can't stop it. And we're getting ready now with resilience to, to, to to build so that we can re come back from the hits. And then he said to me, well, what are you going to do for my next? This is the 2014 one that just happened. What are you going to do for us now? And I said, well, I have a feeling the world is going to move to a state where we're concerned with the different types of hits that we're going to get. So I was thinking about making a big painting called Perturbations. You know, the people are going to want to know what, what's going to hit us and how, OK. And he just smiled. And later on in the evening, he was walking out the door, and he turned around, and he surprised me, because I never thought this. And he suddenly said, you tilt at windmills. I went home. I didn't, I didn't know if it was an insult or what. <laughs> but he doesn't insult people, because you know Don was crazy. And I know there's a little bit of that. And then about 24 hours, I said to myself, wait a second. You know, The thing to do is to reach in the humanities and make the Don Quixote story available to this gentleman, that gentleman, and others, Anna, et cetera, so they can tell their story. Okay? So, so over here, Don Quixote and Dulciana discover a fundamental thing, that, that the burning of coal and oil, and you can see oil, coal, the burning of it, of it transforms into gases. And they looked at where those gases go. And they said, wait a second, that looks like an extended nose. And look, and Don said, where do those, that nose and the gases go? And they noticed it comes all the way down here, and it goes into the heart of this thing. And it clicked in Don's mind that this, these gases are feeding the heart of a beast. And he started to imagine this beast as the greatest threat of our time. Just like 400 and something years ago, he imagined dragons, dragons, as the great threats of his time. And he had a great imagination. And he said, wait, it's probably going to, well, first of all, polar bears, melting ice pack. That's not enough of an image for me. He would imagine at, at a windmill. As you know, he was into tilting at windmills. And he would see that windmill, like this, being fed in its heart. And just like when he discovered the windmills and thought they were giants, they had four arms, right, coming out their back. And he would then say, wait a second, I've listened in a way to the folks like Chris Field, 
and, and maybe not clearly enough, but each of these arms is probably going to wreck or disrupt some aspect of the lives of him and everyone else. And that black arm right there is symbolic of what climate change is going to do to our water. Not just dry it up, not just make the oceans acidified, not just make the waves greater and higher, but the water that comes down when we're not expecting it, it's going to cause floods. So that arm symbolizes the impact climate change is going to have on water. That one up there symbolizes the impact it's going to have on our air, the quality of the air, the, 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 how it's going to hurt our health, and also the velocity, how much, how much more powerfully in some places the wind is going to blow. And that one, Don Quixote would say, is the arm that's going to affect the temperature. In some cases, the temperature is going to increase. It's going to decrease. It's going to create great havoc for us. And then, and this is my question to you, but you don't have to, just to think about it, if that's water, air, and temperature, what's that one? What's left? OK. I think, I think there's a lot of good answers. But Don, would, it is going to be the increase and severity of weather events. And so, and Don's imagination would be even greater than it was when he first started tilting at windmills. He would envision what was inside the stomach of climate change. And maybe if it was on the climate change menu on a certain day, that could be North Port Virginia being, you know, consumed. That could be Miami. It could be the California Delta. You know? Okay. And when he envisioned all of this, he would then say to himself, God, I got to do something about it. And he would, he would say to himself, wait a second, I got to execute a real powerful, a real powerful, I have to find a real powerful weapon. And he would think and think, and he would say, others are apply applying the conservation, the increasing the weapon, the renewable energy weapon. And he would sit back and he'd say, wait a second, those are all good, but are they really strong or are they really helping? And he would say, wait a second, we already have probably enough greenhouse gases around the planet. And he would say to himself, the world is using that much gas, uh, needs that much energy right now, in 10 years that much, in 50 years about that much. And what is there the world's choice of energy. It's fossil fuel, and it will be that for many, 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 many years. It'll be that because fossil fuel, coal and oil, is cheap, and really cheap. And there are energy-deprived areas of this world. They are going to continue to cut down trees and because they need the energy. So he would say to himself, what is the strongest solution, the strongest weapon I can use against climate change? And he would say, wait a second, the world needs a national energy strategy, at least the United States. And he'd put that aside, he'd see it important, but then he said, look, the first step is we have to cut, we have to put a tax on carbon. And he would, and Dulciana would say, it, that carbon tax would work something like this. For those who do not cap, and reduce their greenhouse gases, they would have to pay money. And that money would travel over here into a national fund that would be used for doing good things and you know, dealing with climate change, et cetera. And it would have to cap, put a cap on not necessarily Exxon, but all the industries that's around Exxon that involved in burning coal and oil. And it would have to put a cap probably on the Coke industry, the Coke brothers, you know, in part because they have great energy businesses and, and they're not, and we have to put a cap on their mouth and their pocketbook, okay? <laughs> and we'd have to put a cap on some, some of the great utilities that are just billowing out 
greenhouse gases like Duke Energy. And we have to continue this relatively aggressive approach by the president and others to further put a cap on oil, a coal. And Don would say, well, when we finally have a, a national tax on carbon, he could sit on his horse on top of this bathtub, which Elton suggested I put in the painting, with a cap on it. And the ho underneath that, or in that bathtub, would be greenhouse gases, you know, carbon dioxide trace, uh, methane, etc. And he could sit, and he could relax, and be rested. Now, is that OK? <laughs> so this is what Don Quixote would think and suggest. And you know, again, this is all an emotional response to what I think is happening and what I think should uh, happen. OK, the second part of my speech is um, two strategies. And earlier I mentioned leadership. And leaders not only try to inspire, it's in their DNA they want to concentrate on resources on what matters most. What matters most is who goes to the Congress in 2016 and who goes to the White House in 2016. That is the, the White House and Congress is the source of solutions, source for a nationwide cap and trade or, or other approach to putting a tax on, on uh, the gases. That's the goal, OK? And Don would say that here's a strategy. And I call it the student vote strategy. There are millions of students in the colleges and universities today. And almost all of them vote. And a good portion of them know who Don Quixote is. And is a household word name in their, their houses, and they inspire them. Those students also have a great need. Almost all of them need to find a job. And if you just, let's take Florida, you know, it's best to always focus on the swing states. You get one or two swing states will, will determine the election next in the 2016. Let's take Florida and Gainesville and Tallahassee and down in Miami are great bodies of students. You go and contact the student body and you say to them, we have a program that the students would love. And the program would be simply like this, climate change, I'm sorry, Don Quixote meets climate change and the job market. You put a program like that together, and you go put it, concentrate on one or two of the, of the swing states. You work that for a year, and the odds are the students are going to vote for only those politicians that are committed to energy stimulus, infrastructure stimulus, and addressing climate change. And you would have a chance to get in, in the White House somebody who supports like a lot of, and in Congress, like a lot of ways we think. I only have one other strategy. And I've worked hard. I continue to work hard to help other scientists, academics, researchers, et cetera, politicians share their climate change awareness story. I continue, plan to continue to do that. But you know, the focus now should also include increasing awareness of the need for a national energy policy. I mean, keeping keep aware of climate change is, is very important. But the focus should now also include trying to build a narrative, a national narrative that helps everyone start to think about encouraging Congress, forcing Congress and the White House to give us a national energy policy. And, and that would significantly help. I'm going to simply end now by saying I, I appreciate this opportunity to share every, uh, all these things with you. And it is clear I provide 
the art that adds a new dimension or another dimension to helping California project its leadership in addressing climate change. And I have one assistant, and that's Carol Harrington, who works for me. We have a lot of art that can, can help uh, other people share their message, and we have some good ideas. And if you like any of the ideas I have and you want to invest in them, I encourage you to do, with it, do that and allow me and you to do more. And with that, I say thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Michael, thank you so much. If you have not seen Michael's other paintings, they can be seen around. In fact, a number of them are being shown right now. Yes? Good. Yes. Uh, for the second time in, I guess, the last year and a half, Roy Baroni, who owns Baroni's Cafe on El Camino in Menlo Park, he is showing what I call Q2. It's another Don Quixote painting, but it's only 10 feet long, and it's called Don Quixote Joins the Battle with California and Sea Level Rise. So that one is there, and it's a showcase painting. But then also to attract new communities, you know, not everyone's going to come out for climate change, I am displaying a six-foot painting, The Impact of the Internet on Civilization, <laughs> another one called The Evolution of Consciousness, uh, and then some other ones. So it's uh, Baroni's Cafe, and it's, they'll be there until August 24th. Thank you. We now move into the last segment of this afternoon, and this is, for you in the audience, perhaps the best part, because this is when you get to have your questions put on the table. Uh, hopefully, most of you have index cards or something like that. If you would pass your cards to the outside, we will have someone to pick them up and get them organized. In the meantime, I would like to ask Chris and Elton a question about some of the approach to this. One of the approaches that has been talked about is a number of small pieces. Elton talked about some of this, lowering the, the increasing the mileage of automobiles and things like that, that individually may be only worth one or two percent of the problem. But is it a viable solution to try to pile a bunch of these small pieces on top of each other and make them really a substantial part of our solution to this problem? Elton, would you like to go first? Uh, yes. <laughs> you, I mean, you can't, um, so if you can't pile a, a collection of solutions together, you're left with either doing nothing or a single silver bullet that does the whole thing, uh, putting all your eggs in one basket. And we don't really have a uh, solution that all by itself can decarbonize the uh, industrial society. Uh, and even if we thought we did, there's enough risk that we should be pursuing multiple strategies at once. Chris? I, I agree with that. The challenge is we have to totally eliminate emissions from fossil fuels during this century. Uh, we have a lot of technologies with the potential to make big contributions to that, wind and solar, nuclear. Uh, but each of them has limits. And this really entering unknown terrain. Uh, the way I think about it, you want to imagine the solution space having four big components. One's conservation, not cutting down tropical forests. A second is efficiency, and a lot of the low-hanging fruit really is in the area of increasing efficiency. A third is carbon capture and storage, which Elton, Elton talked a lot about. Really important, particularly in the sense of engaging the companies that really know how to do things at scale. And the fourth is non-emitting technologies, whether it's nuclear, wind, solar, biomass. And it's very hard to imagine a solution that doesn't involve all those components. There has been a question from someone in the audience about the issue of carbon sequestration and the resistance that uh, a number of people to seem to have to using that as a major piece of our strategy. Uh, 
Chris, would you like to talk about carbon sequestration and how you think it fits in? Sure. Um, carbon capture and storage is something widely used, widely deployed already at industrial scale, millions of tons a year. Most of the applications of carbon capture and storage are now for enhanced oil recovery. The oil companies pump vast amounts of CO2 into formations in order to get the oil out. They know how to do it. Um, we have a tremendous network of oil and gas pipelines around the world that could actually be used for moving CO2. The great benefit of being able to deploy carbon capture and storage at scale is it gives us dispatchable energy, or whether it's based on fossil fuels or biomass. It lets us take advantage of a vast amount of existing energy infrastructure. And it's actually something that we know we can do relatively cheaply and we can do at scale. There, there are issues that we need to be really careful about. Uh, we need to know more about the risks of leaks. Uh, we need to make sure that we know how to uh, move the CO2 around safely. Uh, but like other, any other massive technology solution, we want to be on top of the risks and we want to make sure that if we deploy, uh, we deploy in a way that makes sense. Thank so, you. I think I'd like to add to that. Stanford has been uh, a leader uh, amongst a number of universities in um, looking at the geoscience and geophysics of uh, putting CO2 uh, underground. Um, I know this has kind of a yuck factor um, to it, but um, statistically, if you were to rank the risk between um, standing in a Texas oil field where they pump CO2 under the ground using a soda fountain at McDonald's or camping in Africa next to a lake, CO2 uh, has a proven track record of killing people standing next to soda machines and camping next to lakes in Africa and has never killed anyone um, in an oil field uh, release in the U.S. So, um, and as Chris mentioned, it is a technology that has been widely used um, uh, uh, in, in the U.S. With, with no fatalities and, as best we can determine, very little environmental damage. Thank you. The question of carbon taxes and their effect around the world, not only on, say, the U.S. population, which resists them for many reasons, but at least I suppose we could argue that if we were to have the will, we could probably tax ourselves and cover it. But the question is, if we start talking about carbon taxes, what about poor people? How do you protect poor people, both here and around the world, from the potential effects of a carbon tax? Um, so ironically, I have many <coughs> well-to-do conservative friends who I have never, ever heard them discuss the welfare of the poor, except when the question of a carbon tax comes up. And then suddenly, they are concerned uh, about the welfare of the poor. So the poor here in this context fall into really two categories. The poor that own cars, and by here we mean the poor in rich countries, and the really poor, the two billion people on the bottom of um, uh, the, uh, uh, the world's economy that um, uh, don't own bicycles, let alone uh, cars. So for the, the two billion at the, uh, the bottom, they're doing so little in terms of a cash uh, economy um, that uh, uh, a carbon tax has only upside for them and very little uh, downside. Um, in terms of the impact of the, the carbon tax on what you might think of as the working poor in the rich uh, countries, which is often you have a vision of, of gasoline costing uh, 50 cents or a dollar a gallon more ultimately as the result of a, uh, of a carbon tax. So we have examples. Um, uh, British Columbia has implemented a, uh, a carbon tax, and the model they've used is 100% rebate. So you kind of universally tax everything, and then you give all the money uh, back, but not to the oil companies, but to individual citizens, um, just uh, divvied up equally. And interestingly enough, two-thirds of the population ends up getting more money back than they pay. All of the poor and most of the middle class. Who is it? that it ends up impacting. It ends up impacting 
the rich because it is the rich that uh, fly in jets and uh, buy huge amounts of oil. So a, a carbon tax is sometimes painted as a regressive tax impacting the poor. All of the evidence that we have is that um, the people who pay more are the people um, like most of us here in this room who um, think nothing about hopping on a jet and, uh, and, and flying somewhere and uh, producing a tremendous amount of CO2. Thank you. You know, uh, one of the things that you need to remember about a carbon tax is that, uh, A, it doesn't need to bring more money into the government. Uh, you can have a rebate system. You can offset other taxes. Uh, you can think about public policy in an intelligent way. And one of the things that I agree with Elton is frustrating is people always envision that whatever kind of policy lever you might pull, you would think about the stupidest, most awkward way to deploy, and then say, well, that has profound disadvantages. <laughs> Yeah, all stupid <laughs> policies have profound disadvantages. And the real challenge is to recognize that uh, there are real damages being created by the release of the heat-trapping gases, and that the uh, market principle says that the people who are responsible for the damage that those gases are causing ought to be paying for it. And I think that if you use that as a simple guideline, you can come up with a wide range of ways to make carbon taxes intrinsically fair. And it's not even necessarily true that it needs to be a carbon tax. There needs to be a price that recognizes the damages that are done by the release of these compounds. Thank you. Michael, it's your turn. Whenever we encounter a new and interesting and complex piece of art, it takes a while to get your arms around all of the parts of it. And I've had a request that you talk about the stomach in the middle. Oh, well, <clears throat> I wanted to get a little personal. And I, I wanted us to think about um, the destruction oh, that climate change could lay on us. So I thought it might be interesting to open up the belly, the intestines of climate change and, and have people think about what's going to happen to them. And actually, when I was making this, I was saying to myself, well, I don't, I, I, by the way, I put some annotation on it to help people understand to an extent what's happening here with the whole painting when I'm not around. But I would have put a menu. You know, if, I was thinking about writing Monday's menu, Tuesday menu, set, and say, this is Miami. What's going to happen to Miami one of these days when climate when the big waves hit or the infrastructure falls out underneath it as a result of sea level. And so that, that's it. I just wanted to uh, touch people. Thank you. Chris, when you talked, you talked, as the IPCC has frequently talked, about the window from approximately now to approximately the year 2100. And there are many of the things that are on the table as being things we might approach that are going to take, A, a long time to implement, and then an even longer time to have them really come to fruition. But the question has been raised about the need to do a number of things more imminently that have a shorter time frame for really making a difference. Could you talk about some of those shorter term things that we might be able to do? Well, the question of time scale is really interesting and challenging one. You know, when, uh, whenever I'm uh, pontificating great knowledge about climate change, I say, well, what if I was sitting here in 1914 talking about what kind of world we were going to live in in 2014? And so I think it's incredibly important to recognize that the kinds of technology changes, the kind of societal changes, the kind of impacts that we can see in a, in a, in a century are likely to be truly dramatic. But before answering the question, I actually want to speak for just a minute about the very long-term changes. In my comments, I mentioned the potential for a commitment to um, tens of feet of sea level rise, uh, to the potential for a commitment to loss of a very large fraction of the world's species. And those are things that, uh, simply as humans, we need to recognize are just fundamentally important. And that we, we would never want to think about a climate policy that was so focused on the present or the next few decades that we didn't have those somewhere in our mindset. 
Uh, when we think about the very short term, it's really important to recognize that no matter how ambitious we are with mitigation tomorrow, we're not going to avoid or delay the climate change impacts that are already baked into the system. Uh, that's the critical motivation for adaptation. But it's also important to recognize that if we want to have any hope of stabilizing warming at something like this uh, 3 to 4 Fahrenheit over pre-industrial, the steps to do that need to begin essentially immediately. And the reason they need to be uh, started so soon is that it takes a long time to change the way that society works. Uh, you know, people talk about the turning the, the, the ocean liner or stopping the freight train. Uh, we really need to be starting to make decisions. And I, I really like the comments that Elton made about increasing investments in research, because in a lot of cases, we don't exactly know what the next best steps are. But by investing in research, in trying solutions, and in building experience with what works and what doesn't, we can really put the, put the pieces in place. Uh, finally, I want to just close with a returning to the comments I made about co-benefits, because we do need to make some investments now. We need to invest in adaptation, and we need to invest in mitigation. But if we do it in a smart way, both of those investments can yield near-term benefits as well as, as long-term benefits. And the benefits can be in terms of a better preparation for disaster, better energy security, and, and more um, equal societies with a, with a range of opportunities for participants uh, across society and around the world. So this thinking about short-term benefits at the same time we're thinking about long-term is what I think the real key is. I'd like to bring up one particular issue with regard to this that has been raised. You mentioned, I, I can't remember, one of you mentioned earlier the issue that if we were going to use nuclear as part of the solution, that there was a long lead time before we would see any result from that. Uh, what are the chances in this climate that we might be able to make some progress on nuclear and make that part of the solution? Elton, would you like to start with that? Well, I think you know all of us who watch the um, uh, situation play out in Japan uh, realize that that uh, is is uh, a sobering uh, thing to watch. So I think there are two pieces to the nuclear question. One is um, who's going to deploy current generation of nuclear power plants. So the the uh, Germans are in the process, uh, as are the Californians in. Um, in uh, dismantling their nuclear infrastructure and really struggling with their carbon footprint um, because um, they have to make up um, the missing uh, nuclear energy with um, uh, some form of, uh, of fossil fuel. Um, the Chinese appear to be continuing on a fairly uh, aggressive um, uh, build out of their, uh, their nuclear uh, infrastructure. I, I would be surprised if the U.S in its current climate, or Western Europe would reverse and um, do a large deployment in the current generation of nuclear power. I think the issue for uh, the West is whether or not we're going to invest heavily in the next two generations of um, design and research, or whether we're going to turn that all over to, uh, to Asia to do. And I think um, that uh, they're really uh, we really should be in a leadership role in the West in developing the next couple of generations of, of nuclear power plants. Uh, and it will take, I think, at least uh, two generations, two, two decades to do. It's time for our last question. Unfortunately, there are still many questions here on my desk. But let's take a brief response to one question, and I think I'll turn this one to Chris because he's, he's seen the most of this. And this is the issue of the climate deniers. Is it economics? Is it politics? Is it religion? Where does this come from and where was it? And we're down to 30 seconds. You know, <laughs> the, Dog gone. Yeah, I, I, I'm a simple scientist. I, I, I wish I knew. But let me just say that I believe that there are people of good faith and good integrity and good visions about the future who can take a variety of perspectives on this. The main thing that people need to understand is that there are ways to build vibrant economies, robust societies, and resilient worlds by investing in climate change. We don't just need to be denying.
I would like to thank all of you for coming. I hope you've learned something new about climate change. I would particularly like to thank Carol Harrington for being a part of this, as well as our panelists.